my story is probably um, not really all that remarkable in that I really grew up uh, with a great family. We um, all all of our family was always together all the time. When I was seven, my mom contracted multiple sclerosis, and it had a weird effect on me. I was the oldest of two girls, and um, and I was perceptive enough to kind of know we were in danger, and um, I just became afraid. I began to be afraid all the time. Um, I found a lot of comfort in the nearness of other kids, boys and girls, and um, really by the time I was maybe in fifth or sixth grade, I had a full-blown growing addiction, a sexual addiction as a kid. The development of same-sex attraction probably started showing up in my seventh grade year. I became fairly exclusive, very emotionally dependent on one of my friends. Um, I began to really perceive what it was to be excited at her pre presence and began to experience that awareness that I preferred her, her over everyone else. Kind of looking back, I realized that even at that early age, I was struggling with some level of depression. Um, and it, it had me. I, I really wasn't doing well in my life. Uh, and then during the, the summer after my sophomore year in high school, my dad contracted um, cancer and he passed away my junior year. And that, honestly, I would say that, would be a, that was just a fatal blow for me. Eventually, eventually, I just kind of withdrew from being able to really function. I had transferred into a private Christian school trying to just kind of manage myself better, be in a better environment, less pressure, smaller environment. And I, I was really f uh, collapsing under the depression. One day during a suicidal season for me, uh, a teacher walking across the campus just stopped me. And she said, God wants you to live and not die. And that was the first knowledge that I had that that God saw me where I was at. And at the same time, I was introduced to a church on in the southern part of my city. And uh, that, that church had a church secretary who played the piano sometimes. And I sort of arrived as he was being given an opportunity to lead worship. And that guy was Dennis Jernigan. And um, he was befriending me, he was friendly toward me and I was getting to know him. Um, I didn't know anybody well enough to tell him my real secrets. But Dennis seemed safe and approachable and genuinely kind and didn't have, didn't really seem to have an agenda with me. So I got to know him a little. And um, when he would sing songs, there were songs that, that were like directed right at the heart of God, straight from my heart, right at the heart of God. And his songs were giving me a language for what was going on in my heart that I didn't have. I met a woman in the church. That This woman was um, strong and intentional and kind and good and confusing and attractive and all those things that I had not dealt with yet in my life. And even though I, over here in, in this new life in Jesus that was astonishing and, his, and the understanding that his loving kindness was penetrating every part of my life, there was a first feeling of um, falling in love. And um, it's, I mean, for me, it's a difficult part of the story because I'm fairly certain that I wouldn't have been able to fall in love had Jesus not been pouring into my heart and driving the fear out. But, but this woman actually swept me away from people, and it happened really quickly. It was, I was completely involved in a relationship and, you know, in a matter of a few days, and I didn't really see it coming. And within a few months, I was completely cut away from the church and completely over in her care. And that relationship um, lasted about two and a half years. We had a conflict one night, um, in part because I was trying to separate from her, but I couldn't. And in this conflict, um, 
during our attempts to make up, the Lord spoke to me in my ear, and this was not an experience I was having all the time. It, 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 I mean, he might as well, if he wasn't there, it felt like he was there, it was that real. And he just simply said to me, I love you, what are you doing? And I felt m my affections change. All of a sudden I was really, um, really put out with what was going on at that moment really put out with the fact that it felt like quicksand. So I just decided um, to separate from her again, and I said, okay, I let's stop everything we're doing right now. I don't want to talk to you. Um, God just talked to me. I'm not really okay with that. This is confusing and weird. And um, the next night, I went to church. And it was just a... I, don't, I actually don't believe it was a coincidence because Dennis was about to go public with his testimony and he was sharing his testimony with the whole church um, from behind the piano, weaving it like a story. Um, and I, I knew that it was an invitation for me to get real. So he gave a song of invitation and um, I think he calls it Song of Hope. And it says, I wish I could take your heart into my heart. I wish I could show you just how good it feels to let go of the things that you know are killing you and cling to the only one who can heal you. It's true. I love you. And I was like, whoa, you know, Jesus just said that to me the night before while I was sinning. So if Jesus can tell me he loves me while I'm sinning, then this is a big deal. It's like it had never really occurred to me that that these things that I was battling against had their origins in, in confusion and had their origins in um, rejecting God's design for me, that God, God loved me so much that he could take me to better things, that I could simply make a choice to put aside um, everything in favor of just following him, to follow God and um, and to let God be in charge of whether anything changed or not. I found myself crying out to God for the first time. I cannot get out of this. This is my life. This is my how I've always been. This is what I'm like. It's full of fear. It's full of unknowns. But, but I need you to help me. Even then, it didn't really occur to me that God would enter into my world and do anything with my basic desire. I assumed that I would just be fighting for the rest of my life basic desire issues, that I would always have to choose Jesus over homosexual in inclinations for the rest of my life. And so there was no real faith in that. Nobody really taught anything different. Den that's why Dennis's testimony was unique for me. It was during that time that, um, in the beginning, that I began to learn the verse, um, from Ezekiel that says, um, I will take, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll take out of you your stony heart and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll take away from you your old desires and give you brand new ones. And I, I've really experienced that. Once I was about seven years into the journey, I kind of realized I was starting to be attracted to men generally, which I thought was a counseling issue probably. This can't be good. It's probably sin, you know. And um, but I also knew that I could. This attraction wasn't really full of the lust, the former lust that I was experiencing. And so I was really encouraged to be patient with that in myself and to not be too quick to judge it as you know some um, blip on the screen that you know I need to get rid of. Um, and then there was a, a guy in particular I started really being attracted to, and I, I asked all of my friends, this is weird Christian culture, really, I started asking all my friends, would you hold me accountable, because this, I, I don't want to, I'm single for God now, you know. Um, and I'd, I would ask them to keep me from pursuing any interest in him at all, but then this guy was pursuing me, and I didn't know what to do with that. I'd given Jesus my singleness and was walking out a really happy, increasingly fulfilled life. And so it kind of surprises me as much as 
um, anybody else probably that I would enter into a marriage and create complicated things for my own walk and journey. We're about to have our ninth anniversary and when I think of it, this just reminds me of where I was. <laughs> so. Nowadays when we talk about relevance and we talk about uh, what is irrelevant to the culture, I just kind of, I can't, can't relate because a very real God stepped into my very real struggle and made himself relevant to me. And here I am 20, 23 years walking with Jesus and um, 23 years since that day of just handing it to him and saying, I don't know what to do. And he's just as real and alive to my experience now as he was then. It isn't just like that it was so cool back then when he started rescuing me. It's like, wow, he is still changing me. I am the quirkiest, weirdest person I know. And, um, and he, he still can change what I'm thinking. He can still go after the things that I'm feeling and um, change me. Out there in culture where we have um, Christians who are trying to address the need of the culture by being very inclusive in a lot of ways, we, we're forgetting that um, you know, if, we, if we remove God's standards as well, we've lost the teacher. This is God's teaching us about what his ways are like. Um, so, you know, some great, great men who have great followings um, are coming out and saying, you know, this is all good. It's all good. We're all going the same place. And it's like, no, um, God enters our lives and he says, I'm God and I'm the designer of your lives. And I have better for you. And so you need to turn from your pursuit and come toward me and let me show you a better way. Let me help you with this. But if you go to people and say, you know, God is so loving and he's so good, but he's kind of impotent. He has nothing to offer you. Just go your way, try to make good with everything and just know that he loves you. That, that's not the gospel. The gospel is um, power for change.